All right, welcome to The Sherman Show. I'm here today with my co-host, Sam Lau. Hey, hey. And we are broadcasting live once again from the city of Chicago. And we're honored today to have with us Rob Stein, CEO and founder of Aster Investment Management. Thanks, guys. It's great to be here. Yeah, so uh, why don't you take us through a little bit of background, Rob, uh, for those not familiar with Astor. Let's start with you first, though. Um, how did you get in, uh, in the investment management business? How did it start off? And uh, walk us through uh, a brief synopsis of your life. Oh, brief. All yeah. right. Well, first, I'm glad you didn't call it the Windy City. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I, uh, I started, I went it's to a, University of Michigan. It's a freezing city, it, by it, the way. It's chilly, it's, but yeah. you know, it's supposed to be in, yeah. in January. <laughs> okay. Uh, but I... Um, I started my career at the Federal Reserve, uh, then under Chairman Paul Volcker, uh, and got some experience about economic fundamentals, uh, went to Wall Street in the 80s, and uh, was a managing director of a variety of bank trading and asset management uh, uh, departments, and I actually managed the prop book, the, the money the banks care about. <laughs> and I started noticing a connection between risk assets and economic fundamentals. Uh, and I started keeping track of it literally in a notebook. Uh, and then as I got a little bit more comfortable with computers, uh, something called <laughs> Lotus 1, 2, 3. Uh, and so fast forward, uh, in, in the 90s, uh, I started Aster. Uh, we did a lot of different things, mostly on the consulting side, as uh, I worked on uh, the investment analysis. Uh, and then in 2001, we became formally registered. Uh, we did really well in 2001. The economic fundamentals that we look at that helps us with asset allocation uh, really started showing signs of some cracks in the economy. Uh, and then we had some tragic events that sort of tipped us over into a recession. Uh, people like that. Uh, we were using ETFs very, very early into exclusively mm -hmm. using ETFs for asset allocation. Uh, the business grew. Uh, we got some more traction. Uh, we did a good job in 08. Uh, it, it grew uh, a little bit more after that for a variety of reasons. Uh, in 2010, we were acquired by a publicly traded firm called Knight Capital Group. Uh, and then in 2013, uh, Knight had some challenges, and we reorganized out of out of Knight. Uh, all along the way, uh, we've been looking at economic fundamentals to drive what I think is the most important decision, asset allocation. Mm -hmm. And we keep refining that by looking at primarily two data points, but not but variety of those two pet data points, uh, employment trends and output trends. Mm -hmm. uh, more people working, making more stuff, the economy goes up, and we like to have more beta in, in those environments. Sounds like a, a permutation of Dow theory, right? <laughs> <laughs> Almost in some way, right? Um, so obviously something struck a chord with me there with uh, working under Paul Volcker. Um, you penned a nice little essay uh, after uh, his passing last year. Um, and ma maybe tell our listeners a little bit about what was it like working for you know, such a powerful big figure um, in the economics world. And also, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what your perception of, of his view on the current policies would be from the Fed, too. Sure. So, um, you, you know, in, in full disclosure, I, I didn't have that much contact with him. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was pretty far down the rung. But uh, um, when I would, uh, he, he was incredibly commanding. You know, he's a big guy and always had a stogie in his mouth. Yeah. Uh, and it, it was, he was very attentive, uh, even to be below on, on the rung to views and opinions. And uh, he, he let you voice them. Uh, you know, with sort of a, a, a direct look, you couldn't really tell whether he was agreeing or not, but you knew he was listening. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I thought that was something that would encourage myself and my colleagues. So uh, I, I worked on money supply aggregation, and, and that was you know, very important at the time, mm -hmm. you know, uh, raising rates to fight off uh, inflation without causing uh, too, too much damage to the economy, other than the double dip recession uh so uh you know in the 80s right 80s, i think it's one of only one or two uh so what what i find um that he would be interested in and keep in mind he was very involved in the financial crisis and right. and, and with the aftermath but uh the policies are sort of um you, you know off the traditional path uh creative unique policies to to fight the financial crisis uh, and come up with new ways of easing when rates got this low. And so I would think if, if I was to speak with him directly you know, uh, um, before he had passed, uh, I, I think he would be impressed with the creativity uh, that the, the various chairmen have had over the last eight, 10 years and identifying what the solution, what the problem is and looking for solutions. Mm -hmm. So you talked about your interest in economic uh, indicators. 
Um, how did you distill it down to something so basic? I, obviously, uh, you, 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 there's many ways of looking at those kind of two concepts, but um, how, how did it, how did it kind of, did you have your eureka moment? Uh, sort of. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, when, when I was uh, on the trading desks uh, and, and even at the Fed, it seemed like the unemployment data, the unemployment number uh, was, was so uh, highlighted and intense. Oh, it's coming out on Friday and I'm going a bit early on Thursday and, and uh, the markets would move wildly on it. And at that time, I had uh, friends and relatives who were moving for, for reasons that revolved employment. Mm -hmm. And so it occurred to me uh, first, fundamentally, uh, jobs uh, and, and job growth and job expectation is an incredibly important thing to everyone. Uh, you will literally pick up your family and move cross country. Yeah. Um, and then the GDP number, uh, you know, obviously a variety of other numbers seem to be something the markets were watching uh, attentively. And, and um, I started keeping track of those two because they, they really moved the market the most back then. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of came to me that these were very, very important things, the basics of what uh, would drive the markets, which basically, you know, they go two and a half directions, right? Up, down, or they stay the same. Uh, <laughs> and, and I had sat in on some quants at the time, and, and the, the formulas were incredibly confusing. And uh, somebody <laughs> jokingly said, so all of that is to determine whether the market's going to go up or down. <laughs> uh, and so starting to keep track of it, uh, I, I noticed uh, very, very solid trends uh, between growth in employment and, and growth in output. Uh, and I was able to track them, uh, and and then I, I, I'm making it very simple here. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things. I don't, don't want to make it sound like you're not doing any work here. Yeah, uh, but yeah, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's 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 uh, a real lot of work. We keep track of a lot of different data points uh, every day. We we do it in a robust, robotic way. Yeah. So uh, what are, what are those indicators telling you today? So when you look across the spectrum. What is kind of the sense that you get of the markets today? And we can talk equity markets, fixed income, whatever it's telling you. Sure. And so uh, our astroeconomic index uh, is basically an aggregation of these data points, and it gives you a now cast uh, of the economy. And uh, last year at this time, so it's a, versus a forecast. Yes, it's a now it's cast. It's a now right. cast. Okay. Right. So, so it's contemporaneous. Yes. Uh, so yes. one of the things we, uh, we we tell people is you can't really forecast recessions. If you could. We wouldn't have them, uh, but now casting's okay, right? Uh, we're like the weathermen that say, "Hey, uh, it's raining. Here's an umbrella," yeah. uh, and we're not sure when it's going to stop raining. But hang on to that umbrella. You know, it's amazing because I, I see that on the phone. I'm like, I'm looking outside, and it says there's a it says there's a 70 percent chance of rain. But I'm looking outside, and it's raining. It's like, wouldn't you update that? For, <laughs> right, right. It's like also I see that too on the the weather app. It's like. The, the, the current temperature is outside the range. And it's like, <laughs> it's funny that you, you bring up the weather because I think about that in, in a lot of economics is that things are outside the range, but they won't change the range. Right. Right. So right. And, they, they don't now cast. Right? Yeah, it's right. raining now. It's right. like, nobody wants to know that. They want to know the weather a week from Tuesday. Yeah. Uh, but it's very valuable to, yeah. to know the weather right now. And it's very valuable to know what the economy is doing right now because you can make portfolio shifts uh, at, a, at a time that will still uh, help prevent uh, wealth destruction. In 2008, whether you identified it in January, February, March, April, May, June, uh, you still were able to protect portfolios. Now, we're mm -hmm. not market timers, mm -hmm. uh, so we could see economic fundamentals changing and, and changing based on how we measure it. So, uh, Jeff, you asked how we uh, are seeing the market right now and seeing the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, so the economy was, was and very— And those are two separate things, right? The economy and the market? Yes. 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 Uh, but but we think that they're related more than uh, probably the average uh, asset manager. Okay. Uh, so uh, what what happened uh, in 2019? Uh, what what happened in 2019 is summed up very simply, right? We didn't have a recession and the markets went up because uh, coming into two, 2019, you had sort of this. Uh, two camps, right? Uh, the damage of the fourth quarter was going to cause a recession, and some of the technical guys said the same thing. Or people like Aster that said the economic fundamentals are still supportive. Our Aster Economic Index, the AEI, was still in the top quadrant, and markets could move any direction on any given day for any reason that I can't forecast. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I can tell you is whether the market is strong enough, or the economy is strong enough to handle these outside influences, and it was. Uh, but but midway through the year, the economic fundamentals started to stall. 
but stall in a way where growth in the numbers uh, were, were stalling. They didn't go negative. Uh, the manufacturing sector did. Mm-hmm. ISM mm-hmm. Uh, had many months below 50, but the economy was held up by strong employment trends. Mm-hmm. And so as, as more and more output data uh, started to uh, accelerate at a lower pace, mm-hmm. uh, we reduced our beta. And so we compare the data to a history of the data. And let's keep with the weather analogy. Okay. If it's 80 degrees and it suddenly drops to 60, which could happen in Chicago, it feels cold, right? But if it's 40, it's freezing to it's me. It's freezing for you guys from the West Coast. No, 60 is freezing to me, I'm saying. It, it, yes, yes, sweatshirts yes, yeah. and sweaters yeah. and fur coats. Yeah. Uh, not fur coats. We don't, we don't wear fur out right. in California. Down yeah. coats, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, if it's 40 degrees and the weather goes up to 60, uh, you know, it feels, uh, feels warm and balmy here. So uh, while we were at 80 degrees, uh, we, we only got to sort of a 60, 65 degrees, which is average. Mm-hmm. And average growth has uh, uh, risk assets still appreciate. But we think the risk during average growth uh, is not – uh, worth having the high levels of beta, uh, plus average growth could be below average growth quite quickly, and we're just a mouse click away from from reducing beta. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's let's try to talk about what you mean by beta. So, uh, not to oversimplify, but when you think about adding beta or reducing beta, how are you doing that? You're talking about ETFs like implementation. How are you using this Astor economic indicator to give you? Um, what this beta component should be, and how, uh, how do you actually execute that? Sure. Um, so when we say beta, we're referring to the percentage of stocks that we have in the portfolio versus uh, fixed income and, and non-correlating assets. Now, keep okay. in mind, we use exclusively ETFs. Okay. Uh, and uh, just a, a little tweak uh, is, uh, while it's simple to just say the percentage, but certain things uh, like the NASDAQ move a little bit more than the S&P. Mm-hmm. So uh, there's a little more beta, if you will, mm-hmm. uh, with your allocation. But let's just stick to percentage. Uh, so we will, uh, we will trim our equity ETFs uh, in, in, in a mathematical way so mm-hmm. that uh, value at risk the risk levels remain the same. Uh, so uh, we were cutting back on pure S&P. Uh, we were cutting back on, on some of the non-US sectors. Uh, and we own something called MidVol. It's an ETF of stocks that are supposed to be less volatile. Mm-hmm. And we, we cut back on that uh, to get the beta down into the 50s, the, okay. the percentage of stocks. Okay. So what, what was it at prior to that, let's say, roughly, just to give our listeners an indication of kind of the swings you're, or the movements you're doing? Sure. Yeah, okay. So we, we were in the high 80s. Wow, okay. uh, for for a while, uh, we, you know, we 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 kind of oscillated between uh, low seventies, high sixty, and high eighties over the last few years. Uh, we're not a timing shop. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we look at economic fundamentals and we care them. We we compare them. But what I like about what we do, uh, just like the weather analogy. So unemployment is uh, recently coming in around three and a half. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when we were young, we thought it couldn't go below six, and certainly <laughs> below four without causing inflation. Uh, so it's done that. But we will be able to uh, ar- articulate that if employment trends go back to four and a half. Uh, that would be considered high unemployment, mm-hmm. and we would reduce beta. So uh, just like in 08, uh, 09, uh, when we saw green shoots, uh, even though we were losing jobs, we were losing far less, and we had enough workers to make enough output to drive the economy forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the second derivative rally, as people <laughs> people refer to it as, right? And, 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 right? and it's often missed. Yeah. Yes. Well, the thing about unemployment, though, too, is that it tends to get kind of sticky at levels, although, as you would mentioned, we've been at this uh, it was decelerating for a long time but then it doesn't it respond pretty quickly too when the unemployment rate goes up it tends to happen pretty quickly because as you said people care about jobs and mm-hmm. when, when they're um, when, when you start to lose jobs it, it tends to be kind of a pandemic so how, how you said you're looking at data daily you only get one monthly you know jobs report number how are you? How are you implementing that and changing the allocation based on um, the timeliness of the data set? Sure. So you get the uh, uh, non-farm payrolls once a month. We get jobless claims uh, every week. Right. You get uh, uh, employment numbers are in the ISM number. Uh, you can extrapolate employment data from GDP, which comes out once a quarter, and then there's revisions every month. So, uh, so th- there are a lot of other ways uh, that we look at employment data mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and output data as well. Right. Uh, and, and then there's 
there's some uh, forward consensus data we look at and inflation data okay. and, and credit spreads, et cetera. Yeah, so et cetera. How, how do you, um, what is it telling you today? I mean, jobless claims, I mean, that chart is just, uh, I mean, it's still hovering near the lows. Yeah, we had a couple of upticks. I mean, it's volatile, as we mm -hmm. know. But, I mean, when I look at those charts, the, the trend has been pretty miraculous in a very strong jobs market. Uh, it, it has, yeah. and, and job growth has really driven the, the economy over the last five, six, seven years. And yeah. you're right, if you look at a chart of, uh, of jobless claims, it's lower right left-hand corner yeah. straight up to the to – the, so we call it pinned. Okay. Uh, it's pinned at its max level. Okay. Uh, so that means that further gains are unlikely to have the same impact on our model. It's okay. sort of doing what it can do. Mm -hmm. uh, but – um, uh, lack of acceleration, like you, you, you sort of nonchalantly said, we had a few numbers, but it, it sort of reverted back. <laughs> yeah. uh, those few numbers we think are worth keeping an eye out sure. for, right. uh, because um, it's it's job growth that I think will be the early warning sign right. of of changing the allocation a little more o output. Uh, has had a unique period of time, and, and uh, let, let me digress for a minute. Please. Uh, I, I would say, and I don't think you guys would argue that, maybe, what was it three years ago, we had a recession in the oil energy sector mm -hmm. uh, in the second or third yeah. quarter. I, I've been contradicted on that, or not contra corrected on that, when I kept calling it a commodity recession. They're like, no, recessions only happen to an overall economy. It's a contraction. A contraction. So <laughs> it, it reminded me of like, the bear market versus the correction. I'm like, okay, semantics, I'll give that to you, smarty pants. Right, right? well, I'm glad yeah. you, I mean, so we use the word contraction yeah. often, yeah. Uh, rather than But recession. it felt like a recession, though. It, it, it well, did, it right? did in it, that yeah, sector, that so right. it was a contraction in the energy sector, and once upon a time, there were many economists who would say, all recessions start with, uh, a sector, a, right? a, a sector yeah. in energy, like right. they go all the way back to the '70s with, um, you know, long gas lines and the uh, the oil embargo and and OPEC, uh, and, and 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 plot it back in time. And and so what what was interesting about that, it, and it had all the signs of a contraction, or if it was a full economy, a recession. Mm -hmm. You had banks that were uh, highly uh, exposed to energy loans. Yes. Uh, oil prices dropped significantly. If you look at the price of oil in that sector as mm -hmm. the stock market, uh, employment trends. So we measure the employment trends in also individual sectors. Okay. Uh, employment trends uh, went uh, flat to, to negative. Uh, and, and you wouldn't argue that we had a contraction there. Nope. And what, If you lived in Texas, it, you, you had a Recession, right, right, right. Yeah. right. What, right. What's the expression? Uh, uh, a recession, a uh, contraction is when your your Na neighbor, neighbor loses his job, yeah, right? Yeah. And, it's a and the recession when you lose yours, right? Right. right, right. Uh, so what I find most interesting, guys, is that it didn't bleed over into the overall economy. Uh, the overall economy remained uh, above trend average. Uh, whatever bounces there were in the stock market, we recovered quite quickly, uh, and and it was sort of kudos to people who are looking at overall economic data. Uh, while uh, uh, there was a contraction and employment data in the energy sector, uh, technology, healthcare, you know, all the usual suspects were growing and the economy hung in there. Uh, I would say that in 2019, we had a contraction in the auto sector. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, back to a similar stance, um, it was once said that what's good for GM is good for the country. Mm -hmm. you remember those comments? Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, the auto sector, obviously there was a strike and, the, and sales sort of uh, declined a little bit. And Inventory levels are high. And, yeah, right, and people yeah. are using uh, the various ride sharing yeah. uh, um, apps. So it wasn't surprising, but once again, uh, the overall economy remained fine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so you point to the different uh, makeup of the economy now, that it's incredibly diverse, uh, so you, you, you look at employment trends of the economy as a whole for signs because the individual sectors uh, are, are not saying what they, what they used to say. You know, I saw a research piece a few years ago from one of the, the major firms out there, and they, they were pausing the idea, and it was, it was post the energy collapse, um, that it would be uh, – we would no longer have these big recessions, and this is very popular today. We were just talking to someone about – um, at Davos, they're talking about there'll never be another business cycle again. And that, that usually means run for the hills. But the idea that was positive was that what would happen is we'd have these rolling recessions in sectors or contract, however mm. you want to define it. And you've kind of seen that, right? I mean, as you, you'd mentioned that. I just named two. Yeah. And in the interim, we had kind of the retail mm -hmm. sector, which continues to be an overhang. Autos continue to be an overhang mm -hmm. today. Um, you know, but 
Is it really that case? Uh, when you look at the, the output you'd mentioned, you said it's more diverse. Uh, I hear the argument a lot that it's really concentrated, though. It's concentrated in tech and it's concentrated in healthcare. Mm-hmm. And so is it is it really that we're insulated or it's that we're insulated unless one of the big ones goes down? Uh, you know, I think it's a combination of both. But I, I do think uh, that the diversity of the economy will make recessions uh, softer. Okay. Uh, but... Uh, I do think that we can have a contraction uh, in the overall economy by a lot of different sectors uh, slowing. Mm-hmm. So it used to be you know, manufacturing, primary, a few other ancillary sectors, and boom, you have a, a recession. Yep. Uh, and they would take a little longer because you have sort of announced layoffs and you have this outplacement plan and you don't really uh, start to see the effects for six, eight, nine months. Um, so I, I, I agree that we will have recessions that are uh, harder to identify, that will have market movements that um, aren't as aggressive as they were. But I also think that's part of uh, the recovery from 2008, uh, two 50% declines in the stock market, two uh, very large uh, contractions, recessions in the economy. And then, oh, hold on a second. Uh, and so uh, growth has been, uh, uh, be- well, you can't say below trend anymore, right? right. Uh, we, we grew up when you could see 4%, right? right? And so right. Uh, it's now 2%, yeah. right? And, and we're roughly there, and, right? And, I mean, we're, we're kind of trend, right? And so, you know, 2%, uh, unemployment below 4 stock market, you know, still averaging, I think for the last decade it was over 10%. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I think there's sort of a new set, a, di- a di- new data series set uh, of what to look at, but I, I would completely agree uh, that the economy has become different, which sort of segues into something that we've been working on, uh, and uh, it's more efficient to become efficient. Uh, e- efficiencies are, are, are uh, getting easy for uh, uh, traditional businesses and small businesses. It used to be, here's this new machine, uh, it cost you X, uh, and in five years, it's accretive. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and, right. and literally two years ago, there was something like that in our business, and about three months ago, somebody came in and said, no, um, we can reduce your cost by three grand a month, uh, it'll only cost 500 instead of 5,000, and we can install it over next weekend. Uh, and, and so profit margins that were giant, of course, competitors came in right away, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and then again and again, and now you could disrupt things with uh, normal average profit margins. So uh, what is that doing? Uh, I, I, I think it's creating a, a difference in profit margins. It's creating a shift in the income disparity. Uh, and, and that's something that I think society wants to happen. Uh, the comment over the summer that uh, corporations are going to look at stakeholders rather than shareholders. Uh, I, I think that by definition means we're not looking to maximize return, mm-hmm. but maximize uh, employee lifestyle, maybe how much you pollute, your carbon footprint, you know, mm-hmm. all of those things. Yeah. And I think that's going to impact uh, uh, the performance of stocks. Yeah, I think people have, are starting to think about it. As you mentioned, I, I saw that about Boeing, too, recently. There was a very critical article I've been saying that that was really when Boeing changed, is that they went to maximize shareholder value versus the integrity of the product or right. the quality of it. And um, that, that's going to be probably a lingering issue. Um, but it's probably part of the other reason you see in the manufacturing data being a little weak. I don't think really people have a really strong bid to buy Max 8 airplanes today. Right. Yeah. And, but, you know, you look now more at the service sector, you yeah. know, ISM service, and uh, we're, we're also looking at that uh, to, to see if there's some signs uh, that mm-hmm. that leads. Yeah. It's, it's been pretty strong, too, right? There's, uh, as we mentioned, the recovery in that data set, too. The service sector has, has remained resilient. And that's one thing we've been talking about in our kind of macro chats internally is that, you know, even though we were seeing that manufacturing, what used to be the indicator for the recession, mm-hmm. um, it's like it almost is that you have to see the service sector really start to collapse as well. Um, and again, we know how much that makes of the overall economy, right? Uh, yeah, and, and the technology uh, as a percentage of the S and P still isn't at uh, dot com bubble, but it's uh, you know it, it's a good twenty plus percent. Yeah, yeah, I think it's almost twenty five these days. Yeah, yeah. just after the run last year, that was the best performing sector once again. Yeah, you know, north of fifty percent. So um, when you came in, we were talking before we started recording. Uh, you said you see a lot of parallels today to nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. So. 
you, you'll get the bullish argument from that. I mean, you can you can unpack that a different way. Some people say, okay, well, we got to lever up our stock <laughs> position, or the impending doom is coming, you know, from tech and telecom. So, um, tell me why you you drew the analogy to 1999 and what the data is telling you today. Uh, sure, and I will try to be succinct about it. I I, I tend to ramble. So, if you remember, uh, uh, 1999, Greenspan uh, and others were very worried about Y2K. Mm-hmm. Uh, hopefully some of the listeners will, will remember Y2K. Uh, and he added a tremendous amount of liquidity uh, into the economy uh, in October, November, and December. Uh, unprecedented amounts. Uh, and so if you look at what's happening in the, uh, in the repo market, the overnight market, yeah. which I'm surprised isn't bigger news, uh, but the, the clogging up and the Fed intervening uh, to provide liquidity in the overnight market is substantial. Mm-hmm. And, and I would argue that that liquidity is getting into the stock market. Now, I can't point to a direct correlation other than a chart. <laughs> uh, it, maybe it's uh, uh, traders get more leverage, uh, maybe margin on futures and options. Uh, maybe banks are being able to repo things that are a little less uh, than, than treasuries. Uh, but, but there is some way that that's getting into the system very similar to what was happening with the liquidity uh, in 1999. And for whatever reason, that additional liquidity found its way in the riskiest of assets. Uh, why, why did, well, it, refresh my memory. Why did um, Greenspan inject liquidity in the markets for Y2K? What, what was the rationale? So the computers would get messed up and you right. wouldn't get money out of your uh, ATM and your bank statements. Right, would, the planes would drop from the sky. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I remember all the horror stories. Yeah. But, but the banking but system. Banking system yeah. That's what they were really concerned yeah. about. Okay. Uh, you know, they would be able to go back. Uh, you know, to the manual days and, yeah, and you yeah. know, go in the overnight market, I need $20 billion for a particular <laughs> bank because I don't know what my balances are. Yep. Uh, and, and they okay. slashed around a lot of liquidity. Okay. Now, uh, I, I want to make a point, though, that, and, and this sort of goes back to uh, how, we, how we look at the economy, and I'm going to give an analogy. So, um, and this will be a health analogy, okay. right? So, uh, pneumonia, uh, uh, the flu kills uh, a couple hundred thousand or a hundred thousand people a year, but it, it doesn't kill healthy people. It, it kills the very old or the very young or, or, or the sick. Uh, so even though the economy could get sick uh, or get weaker, rather, uh, uh, I can't predict an event that it gets pneumonia and has a wealth-destroying event. I could not predict, nobody could, what happened in 2001. Uh, and so even though uh, if you draw the parallel, uh, it will say that this liquidity has sort of a, a blow off in, in risk assets and stocks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we go back to a, a, a healthy to slightly unhealthy economy. And that could be fine unless one of these outside factors, whether it's uh, a bank blow up or a currency devaluation or uh, some tragic event, which you can't predict, mm-hmm. then the economy won't be strong enough. Uh, to, to bounce off that. So, uh, nutshell, uh, I, I'm paralleling that the economy will weaken to a point uh, where if we have an outside event, it, it could cause a problem. Okay. So, um, given, given that, and you talked about your beta adjustments, where does that put you in that range that you said you've been on the average? Are you on the low end of the range, I assume, given that? Or are you trying to ride the liquidity wave while the Fed keeps um, increasing the size of its balance sheet? Because that that chart that you're talking about is very powerful, right? Uh, From when the Fed was reducing the balance Mm -hmm. sheet Mm -hmm. to, you know, the the rebound with this repo facility, these standing terms. Um, I mean, that that is what people call the catalyst for this last risk rally. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, and like you said, that you know, we have a, we have a copy on the chart uh, on a blog I wrote on on our website, but it it certainly uh, visually looks looks very strong. But yeah. uh, your answer is no. Uh, we are not riding the liquidity wave. We're we're happy with uh, mid fifty beta. Okay. Uh, you know if the market conti- we're, we're not market timers, but sure. if the market uh, continues up from here, uh, we're we're capturing it. Uh, you know we're not an S and P tracker. Uh, if there's some challenges in the economy, we we feel comfortable with with how the market would perform, uh, having lower beta. But what what I like the most about it is we're a mouse click away from either getting defensive or seeing signs of additional strength in the economy where we add beta to it, which mm-hmm. is equally as, as possible. Yeah. So 
What are you seeing kind of in those second derivative rallies? Because we, we've seen a weakening of the data set really started significantly over the summer last year in 19. Um, from there, it seems like, you know, outside this man, I'm gonna call it a manufacturing scare. I, again, I don't work in the manufacturing sector, sector, so it's not a recession to me. Uh, it's easy to say that, right? But um, it, it appears, again, and it's always hard to identify these inflection points, but it appears, it appears that we are moving in a positive direction from the output, as you said, right? The, uh, the economy growing, and specifically outside of that manufacturing sector, the data is looking pretty strong, not just in the U.S. It seems to be picked up, and I would attribute that to some being the Fed's liquidity facility. Mm -hmm. uh, the PBOC, for instance, uh, did a lot with you know, cutting the reserve requirement ratio a few times last year. There seems to be this liquidity awash uh, around. Um, do you do you see the same thing in the data today, or, or what is it telling you? Um, so I, I see the data uh, continuing to accelerate. Uh, you know, negative uh, rates in you know a handful of countries around the globe. Just you know, history has shown that we don't have above average growth. Uh, the U.S. Um, you know, didn't quite get there, and now the yield curve has steepened. Uh, so I, I think the liquidity is definitely uh, helping uh, with with some of the sectors that, that you identify. But I am not seeing the type of acceleration in those numbers mm -hmm. uh, that would make me say, uh, let's go all in. Okay. Uh, but certainly, I want to reiterate this. Mm -hmm. Average growth right. is okay <laughs> right. for stocks. Right. So the fact that we're average isn't you know, I mean, you should likes, have an average allocation, yeah, right? Yeah, right. Right. You know, and 60 40 is sort of the average, so we're yeah. slightly below that and we get up to 80 90. But, um, but it seems like for the first time in uh, a couple of years, uh, I could pencil in data points that have been in the range of the data in the last five years that could signal uh, a substantial contraction or slowdown. And what's different is I wasn't able to pencil in some data two years ago yep. that would, even if it hit, you know, if, if, if you're going, you know, uh, three for five at bat uh, and, and you, uh, you have the next five at bats, and even if you go one for five on those, you're still going to have a substantial batting average, right. you know, yeah. Yeah. batting 400. Ba baseball is one of those strange games where you, you fail more than you succeed and you're a champion. Yeah. You know, <laughs> right? Exactly. I mean, if you were three for five from the free throw line, well, right. I, mean, I guess Shaq was still Shaq, a good player, uh, yeah. you know, but um, it, it is amazing that baseball is a game where you fail more than you succeed. Um, right. And that's arguable about Shaq. He's yeah. not on my top 10 list. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It was always just like, why, no, don't, you, why, don't, you under, why don't you just underhand it? Like, right. I mean, you know, so there's got to be a better because he threw darts. Anyway, uh, not to digress there. So what um, can you give an example of one or two data points that you're talking about here that if you pencil these things in, uh, you can see some substantial contraction? Uh, oh, sure. So uh, ISM, okay. certainly. Uh, we look at consensus economics reports, uh, and, and while they've been revised up a little bit, but uh, in, in the range, uh, and a jobless claims, right? Yeah. So you, right. you had talked about the chart uh, and how it's just been you know, stellar. Yeah. Uh, so when you get pinned at, at the max for so long, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't take a few data points that bring you down from that. So uh, I, I would say I could pencil in some, some uh, jobless claims numbers over a three, four, five month period, uh, you know, just to name three. Okay, all right, well. I was wanted to see what role inflation you th what, what do you think uh, inflation would do to that as well? And perhaps even just rewind the conversation back to you know your days at the Fed with uh, Volcker being brought in effectively to wage war on inflation, and you can say he probably won that battle. And you know here we are today looking at you know 2.3 um, CPI across both headline and, and core. Uh, is inflation dead? I mean, we've got a different Fed today who's looking to, to stoke inflation. Are they going to be able to do it as well? Yeah, so I, I, uh, I, I'm concerned about that. Uh, and and uh, I, I think that uh, there's also a concern of deflation, which is, you know, incredibly problematic. So we've definitely fended that off for the, for the near term. Uh, but uh, the real primary cause of inflation uh, is wages. And uh, if you look back 
uh, in what was it uh, 90 uh, 07 uh, one of the reasons for that uh, out of the blue rate hike before we had the intermediate cut and the cut and the cut and the cut uh, was we were starting to see wage growth mm -hmm. and we hadn't seen wage growth because people were making money in their stock portfolios they were refinancing their house and when they were done doing that they demanded uh, higher wages uh, so we've had some wage growth uh, recently uh, I'm, I'm not sure that it's enough uh, but if we continue to have wage growth, which will be will be good, and it's not offset by some spending habits, uh, I, I think that that would uh, lead me to believe we can we can get some inflation. But I think that we have become so efficient at hiring needs, mm -hmm. and people are so willing to augment their income that we're not seeing the wage growth. Uh, that I would expect at this stage of, of the low unemployment. Mm -hmm. And that uh, con concerns me that uh, we aren't going to be able to get the inflation targets that the mm -hmm. Fed would like to see. It, it seems like you know, you're just blaming Uber and Lyft and all these things, too. But when I think about that, you're talking about augmenting income, and you know, they're, they're famous for, like, get your side hustle on, or you know, this gig economy that we talk yeah. about, too. But uh, I'd read I read a piece by someone um, well well known manager out there that was saying that th the reason that we have this disinflationary environment this low inflation environment to to spell it out a little better is because of the um, price suppression of some of these apps for instance and so they're being subsidized by the VC world the PE world mm -hmm. um, that ultimately that Uber should cost more Lyft should cost more but the amount of capital has flooded that market and they're able to subsidize it so it's a below market price uh i thought that was a Agreed. very interesting argument that if they ever actually charge the price and didn't just lose money all the time sure right uh quarter after quarter that amazon know, loses money right but amazon also invests too. right, I, right. Not, not that not that i'm not here to criticize any single name but no, by any I, means I, yeah I, right but um when you look at it it's that the subsidy is what's keeping a lid on some of this inflation i thought it was a very interesting argument that it was the, the the liquidity, the capital is what's actually causing less inflation, where a lot of people think it's an accelerant. So cl clearly, and, and I agree with that. And so yeah. this back to the wages. If, if you ever talk to an Uber driver, and and just I ask try them, not to, but they love to talk, don't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, they do in general. In general, and, in general. and I I, uh, I generally ask them how how's business? Yeah. Uh, are you you know in the same spot you were a year ago? And and pretty much universally, it's no. And so it seems like the efficiency that, that they're they're not they're making not. as much money, no. or there's no less rides, or what what um, is that? So they're as busy. They're making it up in in volume okay. to a certain extent. Uh, so the compression. So you got the VCs funding it, and then you hit the the worker, the wages, mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, Sam is what I think. Uh, is, is going to impact uh, wages and then inflation, right? So, but you're right uh, that uh, the VCs are creating a below market price, and that's not sustainable forever, right? So, what what changes? Is is it the the movement of the people? Is this unionizing, or you know, we're in Chicago, right? You know, the home <laughs> of the union, right? And and, and the and the worker. So, I, I got to think about it. It's like, what is the catalyst to change? Is it that we stop using them? I mean, I, I don't know. What is it? Well, right? So yeah, let's right. go back to basic economics, Please. supply and demand, yeah. right? So uh, the, the great thing about the energy market is the cure for high prices is high, high prices. prices. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. You've heard that one. Yeah. So um, I, I, I think, and when I said it's more efficient to become efficient, so you used to not be able to compete with all the VC money and all the things that uh, they're they're creating, but then you wake up one day and and like somebody was trying to sell me something a few years ago, and then the next version of Outlook did it, and I was like, well, that was cool, but <laughs> look, and I now can do it here. <laughs> right. Uh, so I I think more efficient to become efficient is going to take these firms that are just being funded by tons of money, and then ha and we're seeing it in our industry, right? We used to use a particular uh, accounting software, and, and, and now we've got something uh, uh, incredibly simple but works amazing. So I, I think that, that as it becomes more efficient to become efficient, you're going to get more entrance into the marketplace, uh, and then you're going to drive some, some people out, or more uh, interestingly, some of these companies that uh, maybe won't get driven out, but their economics are going to change. They put so much money in doing what the guy did six months ago for a third of the investment. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, you know, you get the supply will then uh, 
dwindle. They'll have price pressure. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, wages will go up with that, and you know you have a, a contraction. And, and then the good thing about recessions is we've always bounced off them and grown higher than we were in the last recession. And we have amazing things that come out of them. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, we had microwave technology. Um, you know, in 07, uh, that was when the cloud basically was coming out. There were so many innovations coming out in 07, right before that recession, that you would say are driving the economy in this uh, uh, last expansion. All right, so I think that's the, that's the one thing about the human spirit, right? Um, you know, th that's the reason people say don't bet against the U.S. stock market or the U.S. economy, because it is that invention. It's the capital flow and the entrepreneurial spirit. And so are we still seeing that? I mean, you're talking about this efficiency. I mean, I think it's because, you know, when you break down GDP, you can talk about it should be labor force growth plus productivity effectively, right? That's kind of one one simple way to do that. And so- That's our AEI calculated that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, shout out to the AEI again. Uh, but I will say that, um, you know, given the fact that we have an aging population, the demographics are not working as a tailwind. They're not a headwind yet, but we can obviously, we could forecast that. Um, is this efficiency and productivity, because you're talking about being more efficient, which is more productive, mm -hmm. but the calculations of productivity from the economists seem to be at very low levels. And so how do you balance those two things? Is it a mismeasurement? I mean, that's been the big debate amongst economists, right? Is productivity calculated correctly? So how do you think about it? Yeah, so we, we talked about that, uh, us, the three of us. Uh, and, and so you got a new normal of what growth looks like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because of that. So uh, the, you know, the aging population and the demographic shift, I mean, I guess they could somehow forecast that out to 2050. You know? yeah. It's like, here's what the population is going to be. So, uh, so I find that interesting. Uh, so uh, you'll, you'll there's going to be off plus or minus 50, 50 million or so, right? Yeah, <laughs> right, right. It's just like the jobless right. numbers, yeah, right? right? Until they, uh, <laughs> or, or, you know, when I was in college and they brought everybody in, they were talking about, you know, various epidemics and, and they, they didn't occur. Uh, but but um, yeah, forecasting is challenging. So I I see that the efficiencies will uh, uh, kind of make up for the decrease in population growth, uh, and so each worker will probably be uh, more productive by some factor than than ten years ago. Certainly, we had the biggest productivity gain in the '90s when everybody got a PC on their desk, mm -hmm. and I, I witnessed that. Uh, uh, begging for one to yeah. mandating one. Right. Uh, and, and so I think that the efficiencies that I'm speaking of will make a, a, a lower population or lower population growth uh, more efficient uh, mm -hmm. and will drive a new normal of economic growth that could drive stock prices to their average. Uh, we're already seeing it. And I think uh, inflation is the wild card. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, does that spark inflation or does it do our worst nightmare? And all the, the liquidity and the negative interest rate that are around uh, turn us into the quicksand of deflation. So you talked about being an allocator and using this um, your economic indicator, the the uh, Aster economic indicator. Got to give it a shout out again. Um, but to to kind of balance this out, and you you use kind of the idea of beta to stocks. You talked about fixed income and then non correlated. You talked about inflation here. If inflation becomes the problem. How does your how how are you thinking about that from an allocator standpoint? Right, inflation shouldn't be good for fixed income. Mm -hmm. um, I argue that it won't be good for stocks probably in the at least in the short term, mm -hmm. uh, given the pricing power we see. Is that just a big boost in the non-correlated? But how, how do you how do you play defense in that inflationary environment? Right. So in in the core portfolios we have right now, and you know we've we've got a fixed income portfolio, uh, active income. Uh, in inflation, we think will show up in spreads, and it'll show up in the economy, the numbers that we look at. So you know people have often said the election or this problem or that problem, and we kind of you know like like I used to say at the uh, University of Michigan when people were talking about football games scoreboard. Yeah, uh, and so <laughs> they're they're known unknowns, right? Versus yeah. the unknown unknown, right? right. Yeah, it's right. like oh, the defense was terrible. It's like scoreboard, yeah. Yeah. Right? right? So uh, kind of the same thing with the economic fundamentals that we look at. I don't really care what impacts the employment numbers or the output numbers. Maybe it's inflation mm -hmm. uh, because that affects how GDP is is calculated, sure. uh, or maybe it's lack of inflation or changes in efficiencies. Doesn't matter because the the premise of more people working. 
compared to a trend, mm -hmm. uh, making more stuff output uh, has a long history. You know, we've been we've been doing this for almost two decades, uh, researching it and doing it in some way, shape, or form uh, since the '80s, mm -hmm. and going back to the '50s of our analysis with John Eckstein, our, our CIO, who joined the firm uh, in 2010-11. Uh, so. Uh, short answer, I guess it's too late for that, uh, is we wait till we see the whites of their eyes. We mm -hmm. wait till it shows up in the data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so on that note, so you've identified that as being a risk. You gave me a couple of data points. Uh, what do you think is a risk that people aren't discussing that's, that's really top of, like it's top of your mind, but that you don't think is getting enough play out there? So I think, um, and it's not necessarily an economic, uh, it's more of a social issue. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think that the millennials, I know we blame them for everything, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they view wealth, the store of wealth, housing differently than we did. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember buying my first house and the broker saying, stretch for the biggest one. Uh, you know, rates are low. and, and Rates are low at 9%. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Right. 8% yeah, right. was like, woo! Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, you would pay off the mortgage over a certain period of time. You would hold your job for for a while, there was sort of this unwritten relationship between business, banks, and and government policy. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, come to the corporate picnic, uh, and, and so I think that that change. Uh, nobody expecting to retire off of the appreciation of their house. Uh, fear of the stock market uh, being where you want your wealth, um, and and how they consume. Like you know, we what, what they call them, McMansions back in mm -hmm. the day. Mm -hmm. It's it's and, and there's a street that that I, I live on, and I have a certain type of house, and there's one across the street built. You know. 40 years before that, and somebody was uh, looking at that house, and, and, and I talked about my house, and they said, yeah, four bedrooms, four bedrooms, four bathrooms, four bathrooms, kitchen with some sort of stone, kitchen with some sort of stone, two-car garage, but they were not the same house, but they provided the same utility, mm -hmm. and we cared about that. Uh, and, and I don't think this generation does. Their clothes, and I've already adapted to the clothes thing, like a sweater is a sweater. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that shift, store of value, how they think of housing, how they think of consuming, uh, as, as that starts to um, um, accelerate, mm -hmm. uh, I, I get very concerned as to what that can do with the overall consumption economy. Yeah. Well, it seems to be that it's a more social construct, right? right? That you know, it's it's experiences versus things. You hear that too, right? It's it, to me, it's adapting yeah. more of kind of the European lifestyle, really. Um, yeah, less materialistic, but yeah. yes. So I agree, but I I think that social. Uh, social changes combined with political and economic change is really what happens. And we can point to a lot of examples. And that's mm -hmm. why when I said one of the things that's concerning me uh, mm -hmm. ab about the potential uh, stock market is looking at the stakeholder rather than the shareholder. Mm -hmm. And I don't want you to think I don't think that's a good idea. Right. Uh, I just think it has implications. So you look at something as simple as, uh, as gay marriage, right? And so in the 90s, it wasn't really even uh, talked about or expected, even among same-sex right. community. Yeah. Uh, and then it became something we want but people were opposed to it yeah. to uh, to making legislation changes to uh, where now a broad set of people have you know the, yeah. the, when you say my partner is coming uh, or my spouse I don't think anybody you know even has an expectation right so you had political change yeah. occurring with social change right. uh, so I think stakeholder uh, versus shareholder I think income inequality uh, which has been news which they're trying to change uh, with legislation will ultimately happen economically mm -hmm. when all three come together. Uh, and, and I think those things, the, 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 the last one I spoke about, will have the biggest impact on standard of living, growth, uh, wealth. It's interesting you brought up the social construct because you know, um, that's one thing when you look back at data, you, you, you're not in that environment, right? You don't know what the pulse of, of things are unless you've lived it, of course, right? And so talking about that, how do, how do you try to incorporate these types of ideas into you know your your indicators or or do you just say okay some things are just not not modelable uh, so we talk about them and we we look at them and we we try to model them yeah. but uh, no matter what we do it comes back to employment and output and and what I uh, appreciate uh, from our, our style is we've looked at employment and output in many different ways mm -hmm. uh, over many different types of time frames, and it still is positively sloped. Yep. Uh, so it works. Now, 
while we think the the way we use the data we use is the best, of course. Uh, but like you know, think <laughs> yeah. of moving averages, right? Is the forty seven and a half day moving average better than the fifty? Yes. Like if, if yes, they're going to really work, they're going to work. Yeah, it's really, it, is. it really oh, is. Okay. It really is. It, I mean, we have that. a lot of data to show it because <laughs> we we just tortured it until the data told us forty seven and a half. <laughs> right. But no, I, I, I'm with you on all that too. But I, I thought it was interesting you brought up the kind of social construct because I think as investors we got to think about that too. But I mean, not just from our own lifestyles, of course, but uh, I think it, it does have a big impact on how capital flows, right? Uh, clearly. Yeah. Right? And it's something that economists and certainly asset managers uh, don't really consider. And if they do, they try to find a sector to take a bet on yeah, right. uh, rather than what's the implication of, of the overall economy. And what we were talking about before, uh, Sam, is uh, a low return environment. And uh, I'm going to take this to, to rates. Yep. Uh, so 30-year rates uh, kind of are a expectation of growth over a long period of time. Like that's the real one, yep. right? And then you got the, the, the 210, which sort of is, t- is telling you what's happening in the economy now, kind of, you know, your yep. expectation uh, of, of what's, what's happening. And, and the a, lot fi- of, a lot of Fed policy, too. In it, that. Is, yeah, it is yeah, these yeah, days right. a lot of Fed policy. Right. And the five year is sort of like, you know, your, your crazy uncle that sort of sometimes it likes the two, sometimes it likes <laughs> your brother, the 10. <laughs> uh, you know, no, I like, I like, like that. that. I like that. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the, so the, the two year, uh, I think, is measuring, you know, what's kind of happening now compared to the 10 year is, you know, expectations in, in the near term future. And the 30 year is sort of what you expect for growth. And in the twos mm-hmm. uh, for the 30 year, it's telling us we're in a low growth environment. And while we had a great 2019 uh, and, a, you know, not so great 2018, it does seem like we are in a low growth growth environment for a long period of time. And all the things we've talked about kind of support that, right? Uh, changing demographics, uh, efficiencies in the efficiencies, mm-hmm. uh, companies that are being supported by venture capital money that can't go on forever. Uh, so all these things sort of point to um, a low growth environment. Yeah, But a low growth environment, doesn't that just mean that you can kind of uh, promulgate the cycle, right? It can be longer, um, because if you have this aggregate, and it's, it seems to me that the low growth is kind of like the Goldilocks of things. Because, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just looking at more recent data, and you have less boom bust. But the low growth, um, usually, you know, uh, usually a recession comes, that you know, people blame the Fed. But a lot of it's just usually uh, inefficient use of capital, too much money sloshing around, right. too much credit, too much leverage out there. But if you have kind of a slower growth and things are more measured, it does kind of seem much, much more optimal than the boom bust. Harder to be a market timer or try to, to be an allocator there. Uh, but it does kind of start to feel that way. No, I, I completely agree. You know, uh, uh, recession uh, expansions don't die of old age; mm-hmm. uh, they get murdered. Right. Um, and you know, who's the, the, the second person to bring up murdering when it came to the economy? Any economy? No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> um, I know Chicago has a high murder rate, yeah, but you know, that's not that's not where we're going. So. Um, yeah. Uh, so. Um, <laughs> And, and a high tax rate to go yeah. along with yeah. it, right? Yeah. Tax per uh, tax dollar per murder. Yeah. Um, so you know it's a lot harder to f- uh, fall off of the tenth floor than the second story floor. Uh, and you know we talked about the weather, and you know you talked about do they change the forecast when when it's now a hundred percent? But they've become incredibly more accurate. Now mm-hmm. it, it's still the weather, man. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that they're more accurate at measuring the economy. Uh, and and tinkering with it and and keeping it sort of in the fairway. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I kind of agree with the premise that mm-hmm. expansions will be longer, recessions won't be as deep, but recessions will be longer. Right. Uh, yeah. And so you know you're not going to get this 50 percent decline, but you might get this 20. We recover f- right. uh, five of it, and then we're you know we're down 15 for you know, one to three years. And, right. and that's what I would expect uh, the next recession, a, a hurtful leg, a, a little recovery, and then flatline for a long, long time. It's kind of like a 70s type of thing, uh, environment, yeah. kind of, really. Yeah, there was yeah. more volatility in the 70s, yeah. but also a fewer participants in the stock market. Fewer people gave a damn uh, mm-hmm. about where the stock market was yeah. at, at that point. And yeah, what, I mean, has that changed in our, in our culture, too, this obsession with the stock market and... I mean, the president tweets about it all the time. That's his barometer for success. And, um, you know, we've taught people over the last few decades that, you know, this is the way to build wealth is through investing. Um, is, is, do you think that that will continue? Because you brought up the millennials earlier. 
and people want to say that the millennials don't own stocks, right? They don't buy singles. They don't even buy ETFs. That they just want to go buy lattes or avocado toast, whatever the the <laughs> criticism is at the time. Snowboarding, yeah, right. But um, at the end of it, uh, I mean, have we hit peak number of people that are going to invest in the stock market, or do you think that um, you know there will always be this this idea of generating wealth through it? Yeah, I um, well, one the bull market in the private market, the private stock market, if you will, is mm -hmm. is you know even greater than what's in the public stock market. Uh, secondly, we're having fewer and fewer and fewer public companies. I, I think there's not enough public companies for the Wilshire five thousand. Yeah, five thousand. Yeah, yeah. Right. I remember when I started, the Wilshire five thousand had like over eight thousand stocks. Right. I'm like, well, why is it called the Wilshire five? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, it's, yeah, it's yeah, the averages yeah. again. Yeah, right. This sounds like a cool number. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, there might be fewer participants in the market, but there will be, I think, I can't see a reversion anytime soon of having more publicly traded companies. Uh, right. you know, you're going to eventually buy all your shares back and take <laughs> yourself accidentally <laughs> private. Uh, so I, I think that'll offset in, in the, in the near term, mm -hmm. you know, fewer places to invest. Uh, so more money pu pouring into fewer stocks. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it, it's hard to say. You know, I, I look at like our 401k participants, um, it's surprisingly lower than what I thought. Mm. Uh, and some of the plans that we we talk to people about, the participation rate is, is lower mm -hmm. than, than I thought. Yeah. Especially in the investment business, you would think that uh, people working in it would, would have a higher than average participation you rate. You would think, right? Right. Um, so uh, we've really enjoyed this conversation, Rob. Uh, maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about Astor, where people can find your information, how they can get in touch with you, how they can learn about uh, these economic indicators, or uh, the economic indicators. Yes. Uh, so the Astor Economic Index, the AEI, is available in the App Store. Just type in Astor Research. Um, you could go to our website. So we, we have uh, four products, we, and they're available in mutual funds, SMAs, and UMAs. Mm -hmm. uh, the mutual funds tickers are available on our website. Uh, go to asterim.com okay. or aster123.com, the easy site, uh, <laughs> and, and you can find out information about our global macro product, our S, uh, Aster dynamic allocation product, our sector rotation product, and our active income product. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us today, but I'd be remiss if I didn't turn it over to Sam for his favorite part of the show. All right, and that favorite part of the show is Sherman Says. So for the new listeners out there, uh, Sherman Says is when I offer a series of prompts alternating between Jeff Sherman and our guest, uh, Rob Stein, and to which you'll provide a top-of-mind response. Uh, we ask that you try to limit it to a one-word response if you uh -huh. can. Make it a little bit more challenging. So right. I'll begin One with... One syllable is better. <laughs> yes. No. I'll begin with uh, Mr. Sherman with commodities. Attractive. Mr. Stein, indexation. Overused. Triple B corporate credit, U.S. A lot. Overused. <laughs> <laughs> Robo-advisors. Interesting. Fed repo facility. Permanent. Can I use one there? Broken. <laughs> <laughs> Permanently. <laughs> Touche. Deflation. Possible. Wealth distribution. Shifting. Central banks. Less effective. Global economic growth, X US. Increasing. US economic growth. Flatlining. And that wraps it up. That was a weird way to end it. All right. So yeah. thank you. All right. <laughs> but again, thanks to, to our, gu our guest today, Rob Stein, for swinging over here and meeting us at the hotel. Um, if you are listening to this and you want to see what Rob looks like, you can go to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can focus on him. He's smiling and waving. Uh, so our YouTube channel is youtube.com backslash double line capital. Uh, you can catch some of our other videos on there, some things that we've hosted at the events. Also, you can get this at the double line website. 
uh, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, all kinds of other stuff that I don't even know about. So again, Rob, thank you so much for coming by. It was a pleasure talking to you and always enjoy the conversation. Appreciate it too. Thank you guys. Thanks.